Hello everyone and welcome to the second in our series of AHDB webinars and podcasts focusing on soil health specifically in relation to the growing of potatoes. Soil health has a major impact on productivity and economic performance and is part of our Great Soils campaign headed up by Alice Sin and Amanda Bennett of the AHDB. Today we're going to focus on some really dynamic questions, in particular what do we want from our soil? Blair McKenzie and Matthew Lamond opened this session asking this exact question. They go on to explore the effects of potato cultivations in relation to soil physical quality and the ability to sustain and produce a potato crop. We then go back to Matthew who will continue the discussion by looking at ways of reducing the risk of compaction by using the Tyranimo tool. This leads us nicely into AHDB's Harry Henderson, who will be demonstrating the practical application of Teranimo in the prevention of minimising damage to the soil structure. He will also deliver some take-home messages around the importance of the size and weight of your equipment in relation to tyres and soil type. Last but definitely not the least, we have Liz Stockdale of NIAP, who will be explaining how to use a soil health scorecard and influence and develop a plan for monitoring soil health within a crop rotation. She finishes off with some thoughts on what good practice in late harvest crops look like. So, before I pass you over to our first speaker, there are a few items of housekeeping I do need to run through with you all. Firstly, all attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. However, please send your questions in using the screen function on the right hand side of your screen. We will try and cover a couple of questions after each presentation and then have a Q&A session at the end with all the speakers. If we happen to run out of time, we will get back to you with an answer via email. Don't forget that bases and Enroso points are available and if you put the normal details required into the chat section, Christian will apply on your behalf and I must mention that nobody else will be able to see this information. Please note there are also handouts available with this webinar and they can be accessed via the webinar control panel. This webinar, as with all our webinars, will be recorded and can be seen again by visiting the AHDB's events page on the website. A link to the recording will be sent round after the webinar. And for those of you who are on Twitter, please tweet away using at AHDB underscore potatoes, hashtag potatoes, hashtag great soils. So without further ado, please welcome Matthew Lamont and Blair McKenzie. Over to you. Thank you. I'm Blair McKenzie. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the University of Dundee and along with my colleague from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, Matthew Lamond, uh, we'll be going through uh, some, some work on think managing soils. I wanted to start with, with just a few slides thinking about soil resilience and recovery in the potato rotation. Next, please. So the first thing is always is to think about what we want of the soil. And we know we want soft, stable soil that allows roots to proliferate, including to depth because particularly for potatoes, getting the canopy established uh, and get intercepting radiation is key to getting good yield. And getting a root system that can power that canopy is important. So we want soft soil that the roots can elongate through. We want that soil to drain excess water, uh, and that means having good macropores, large pores that will drain the excess water, but enough medium-sized pores that will hold the nutrients and, and, and plant available water. We want it not to be contaminated, it should have good functioning biology, good biology, the earthworms and things that make the pores and cycle the nutrients, but be free from pests and diseases. So next slide, please. So the, 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 there have been a number of surveys across the country of people thinking about how what the state of our soils are, but for, for potatoes, I think the best data set is still the one that Mark Stallum did uh, and, and published in 2006, where he looked at a range of farms across the UK, uh, all for potatoes, and used a penetrometer to push a needle into the soil to determine how hard the soil was because how hard the soil is limits or shows how limited root growth is. And he found that in a, in a very high percentage of the soils, there was a, a the soil was so, so strong that it restricted or limited root elongation and thus limited the ability of the crop to establish a, a full canopy. Uh, next, please. So uh, we need, that was, that, that work was done some time ago. Uh, I don't know of a better data set for potatoes. Uh, and so the questions are, are we in a better or worse state now? Next slide, please. Um, so I don't have data for, particularly for, for more update data to potatoes, but I think it's worth dwelling on uh, some comments that we've got from some cereal crop work that we've done in Scotland, 
uh, where we've gone out in May uh, to, to spring sown cereals uh, under a range of tillage systems, be it ploughed or, or min-till or no-till, and under, under different traffic conditions. And if we think about how far we can push a, that penetrometer needle in before the soil reaches a limit, uh, we find that looking across a number of seasons that it's been particularly wet winters that uh, are limiting or causing the soil to slump uh, and that makes the soil hard. So our wet winters that we've had a number of recently, and extremely wet ones, not cold but wet where the soil is, it becomes anaerobic, you get those horrible sulphurous smells and the bio, good biology, the anaerobic biology can't function is when we have problems with slumping and, and, and setting of the soil. So uh, it's not only the weight of machinery, which, which is the key thing, but also uh, the wet um, conditions. Next slide, please. Um, also, we, need, we know we need to minimise, not do damage, not use cultivation unless we have to. And again, some data from, from Mark Salem as part of the, this grower platform project, where he looked at the depth of destoning or declotting of soils. And, he, and his data show that where, we, where, he, where the depth of destoning or declotting is decreased, even by only you know, four, four to 12 centimetres, uh, we see an improved yield. The, the soil is less, um, is less compacted and, and, less, um, and less exposed to oxygen, and so the, the organic matter holds together better. Uh, so we know we want to minimise the amount of times we cultivate. Next slide, please. Um, also, similar, similar data from, from the uh, Centre for Sustainable Cropping in Balrudry in Scotland, uh, where there have been two crop systems, both including potato, a, a crop system, uh, six-year rotation, uh, with, where there's sustainable or integrated management, where there's long-term organic matter additions and where possible, uh, the cultivations are decreased or a conventional practice. And we know that where we've got the organic matter additions, where we minimise disturbance, we find the soil is more stable, uh, and, and that's shown on one of these graphs. And our, for a range of measures, bulk density or least limiting water range, or a whole other range of suite of soil physical measurements, we find that where we've minimised uh, cultivation, minimised, not done unnecessary cultivations, and where we've added as much, got organic matter into the system, we find the soils in better condition. So next slide. So. That's having set the scene, I want to now go on and talk about and introduce uh, risk, reducing the risk of compaction, which is the increase in density of soil as a result of traffic. Um, and I'll take a little bit more and then hand you over to Matthew before coming back to me. So next slide, please. So what is Teranimo? Teranimo is a free to use online tool uh, that demonstrates uh, soil compaction for given machinery, uh, tyres and tracks, for so given soil conditions, texture and bulk density, organic matter, at the various soil water status. It's hosted uh, by the University of Aarhus in Denmark, but it's, it's, it's not, a, not just a Danish thing, it's, it's at least European-wide, if, if not more. Uh, so it reveals the severity and depth of compaction created for a given set of circumstances and allows comparisons, thus making it possible to inform decisions. So next slide, please. So if you Google Teranimo or you go to www.teranimo.dk for Denmark, you'll find an opening screen that looks like this. You'll notice there's down the bottom left hand corner, there's a PDF which introduces you and gives you some information about how it works and some of the science behind it, some of which Matthew's about to cover. And obviously there's different for, for a range of different countries and we've got the UK in there. Uh, so you just click on the link to um, the Teranimo UK and the current version establishes. So with that, I'll hand back over to Matthew with the next slide, please. Thank you, Blair. <clears throat> so I'm Mathieu Lamondé. I'm a researcher working in Denmark at Oslo University. And uh, I've been uh, developing this tool uh, for the last uh, 15 years, So it, and it's still uh, under development. So each time we have new results, we implement new features in this, uh, in this model. And my uh, idea was uh, today to present you what is in the engine of Terranimo. So how we do the evaluation of the soil compaction risk in, in Terranimo. Uh, it's a very simple uh, thing um, 
we start with is because it, we, what we do is that we compare the stress that we apply to the soil with a, a given machine to the strength of the soil. And then if we have a stress larger than the strength, then the soil compaction risk. So it's very simple. What is less simple is that to get the stress and the strength, then there is a range of different parameters from the machine, but also from the soil that we have to handle in different equations to be able to compare the stress and the strength at a given time. And that's what I will go through now in my presentation. I will start with uh, the different parameters that will influence the stress level below the a tire or a track. It's the tire size and inflation pressure, the wheel load, and the effect of repeated wheeling. And then at, uh, I will talk about what are the parameters and present in which direction these parameters influence the soil strength, clay and organic matter content, the buoy density, and the soil water potential. Next slide, please. So we start with the, the effect of tire size and inflation pressure. Here it's an example of uh, measurement beneath two different tires with the same wheel load six tons we have a large tire 800 millimeters it allows a inflation pressure of one bar 100 kilopascal and then we compare that to a small tire 385 millimeters wide and this tire needs much more uh, much higher pressure to carry the same load and what you can see is that we have a completely different distribution of the stress at the contact between the tire and the soil. And that's, that's from measurements. Uh, so you can see that for the large tire, we have a larger contact area than the, for the, uh, the small tire. And then we have also much lower stresses that's on the Y axis, axis on this of this figure. Uh, much lower stresses below the large tire than the small tire. So the size is important and the inflation pressure is important. Next slide, please. A little bit more about the inflation pressure. We tested different tires with different load in different inflation pressure. Here it's uh, an implement tire, uh, 650 millimeters wide, where we had the six ton wheel load. And then we, uh, we choose, uh, we first made some tests with one bar in the tire, which is the recommended inflation pressure for uh, driving in the field at 10 kilometers per hour. And then we make them some measurements with the uh, inflation pressure that you would use on the road when you are driving 40 kilometers per hour. And you can see that you have much higher stresses at the contact if you do so. Next slide, please. Uh, we had, as I said, we tested a range of tires with different wheel load and inflation pressure. And uh, we compared the inflation pressure in the tire with the maximum contact stress measure, measured between the tire and the soil. And as you can see on this graph, all the points are almost on a line. And this line is parallel to the one-to-one -one line, but a little bit over this line. It means that at the rule of thumb, for any tires, any inflation pressure, any wheel load, the maximum stress at the contact will be approximately 0.5 bars over the tire inflation pressure. So now you can, you are very easily, you can evaluate what is the maximum stress at the contact between the tire and the soil from the inflation pressure. Next slide, please. We tested also different co tire constructions. <clears throat> For example, on the left, you have uh, tires of with the, exactly the same dimensions, and uh, but the completely different construction, a bias and a diagonal tire. We had the same wheel load, the same inflation pressure for both, and then we measured the mean soil stress at 20, 40, and 60 centimeter depth. And we could not measure the differences between these two tires. On the right side, <clears throat> You, we tested three different tires with that are uh, VF tires, flotation tires, with the same dimensions, the same wheel load, the same inflation pressure, 80 kilopascal. And again, even if we had la uh, la major differences in the construction of this tire, because for example, the Cerex Beep, it's uh, reinforced with a, a steel inside 
to be able to uh, to account for high variation of load, for example, on the combined harvester. While Evobib is a, a very flexible tire that uh, change a lot of uh, in the form, in the shape, when you uh, deflate this tire. But even if we had very uh, different tire construction, we could not measure any differences in the soil. So what I'm talking about that is because when you are in Terranimo, when you want to evaluate the risk of soil compaction, and you cannot find exactly the, the tire that uh, you have on your machine in the system, then you can choose a tire with the same dimensions. And if you put in the right wheel load and the right tire inflation pressure, then you will have a, a, a fairly good evaluation of the impact of this tire. Next slide, please. We also tested the uh, differences between tire and rubber track, and then we included this option in Terranimo. To, you can also put some rubber track on on few of the machines. In the in, in this test, we had a large tire with low inflation pressure, and uh, we had a 10 tons uh, wheel load. Next slide, please. And what we measured is that for the tire, we have a much smaller contact area than for the uh, rubber track that was expected. And we also have higher stresses below the tire than below the rubber track. But what we can see on this graph on the right hand is that below the rubber track, you can still see the wheels and rollers of the rubber track, the impact of these on the stress distribution. So it means that as, as they are now, the rubber tracks are like several wheels passing after each other. Next slide, please. So that's a red light <laughs> when you use Terrani. Well, you have to remember that if you put a rubber track on your machine, uh, instead of a tire, and that's what we see on the left hand side of this slide, you will have lower stresses bit below the rubber track than below the tire. And then on the table on the right, for these two configurations that we, uh, we tested in the field, we measured the same effect of the tire and the rubber track on the bulk density. But in the case of the rubber track, we have a much a larger decrease of air permeability in the soil than for the tire, even if we had lower stress level. It means that when you use rubber tracks as, as it is now in Terranimo, you have to remember that there is this, uh, this discrepancy between what we are uh, looking at in terms of stress and the, what, we are, what we have as an effect on the soil. So the rubber tracks are not looking as maybe looking too good as compared to what they really are in the in the in the real life. Next slide, please. A few words about the wheel load. Here you have uh, two different tractors, and uh, if you combine the wheel load and the contact area for the rear uh, tire of these two tractors, then you get approximately the same mean ground pressure. And I have a question to you. That uh, will Christian will show you on the yes we have a small poll. It's for a given soil condition. One of these two propositions is valid. So you remember a small tractor and a and a large tractor. Will the highest will you get the highest risk of compaction driving with the small tractor, or will you get the highest risk of compaction driving the big tractor, or will you have the equal risk of soil compaction with both tractors? So you will have uh, five, 10 seconds to answer this question, and then we will see the result of that. Yep, getting about half people voted now, so I'll give it another five or 10, getting to about 70% voted. So I'll close it now if you want. Okay, so the right answer is that you will get the high risk of compaction using the big tractor. But looking at the data I just so, uh, showed you before, we will expect the equal soil compaction. So now we, uh, next slide please, I will explain you why. Next slide again, yes, thank you. 
So <clears throat> it's a, com a, co a question of combination of wheel load, inflation pressure, and tire size. And it's from uh, an old theory from uh, 1900. So if you have the same stress at the contact, if you have a bicycle, a car, or a tractor, the stress at a given depth will be proportional to the size of the contact area. And if you look at this graph, it's because you have many small vect stress vectors at the contact. And next slide, please. To evaluate the level of stress in the subsoil, then you have to sum up all these small vectors to get what is the stress level. That's why you will get higher stresses below the big tractor than below the small tractor. Next slide, please. We tested that in the field because that was the theory. We wanted to, to check that. So we use a big, a big uh, tire and a small tire with the same construction. And we adjust the wheel load to get uh, the, mean, the same mean ground pressure for these two tires, approximately 90 kilopascal. Next slide, please. Then we drove on the soil in the same soil condition. And on this graph, you can see on the vertical axle, the depth, and on the horizontal axle, the stress in kilopascal that we measure in the soil. So if we start at a depth of zero, you have two different colors. The orange color is for the big, tra the big tractors and the small color is for the small tractor. If you want to reduce the stress in the top soil, you have to reduce the tire inflation pressure. That's what we saw just before. And you can see on this graph that stress level is approximately the same at 30 centimeter depths, 0.3 meter, but the two curves have crossed in each other between 0.3 and 0.6 meter depths. And then you have higher stresses when you have six ton on the tire than when you have three ton on the tire. It means that you have to reduce the wheel load if you want to reduce the stress in the subsoil below 50 centimeters. Next slide, please. Few words about the soil strength. What are the important parameters? First, it's the uh, water content you have in the soil, if it's wet, moist, or dry. Next is the amount of clay. That's what we use in the model. So I took two different ex uh, ex examples here, a sand and a loamy sand. And you have to look at the dry bulk density and the amount of organic matter. Next slide, please. If you have a moist soil, then you will, you will not see so many differences in strength between a sand and a loamy sand. If you are going wet, then the sand will be weaker than when it's moist, but it will be more stronger than the loamy sand. And if you go dry in, during the summer, for example, the sand will be stronger than when it's moist, but less strong. Uh, weaker than the loamy sand. Next slide, please. Uh, at the end of uh, these few slides, I will now talk about repeating wheeling, re repeated wheeling. That is a new feature that is uh, available, where if you have uh, a tractor or an, an implement, uh, you can uh, have a different evaluation for each wheel passing on the soil. It means that you will have an influence of the of the previous wheels on the soil and will change the soil strength. So for example, you have the tractor front wheel passing, evaluation of stress versus strength. Green light, no compaction. Next slide, please. Then comes the tractor rear tire. And the strength in this example, the strength of the soil is uh, lower than the stress applied. Then you will have an increase in bulk density, an increase in degree of saturation. It will decrease the soil strength. Next slide, please. It means that the trailer front wheel will pass on the new, on the different soil, strength number two. It, and when you do the evaluation, next slide, please. You might have again a risk of compaction and it means that you will increase the bulk density again increase the degree of saturation and decrease the soil strength and then the tractor rear tire will pass on the soil that is even weaker so that's important to think about how many wheels are passing in the same line 
that was uh, my last slide and I give the word back to Blair. Next slide, please. Ah, next slide again. Okay, so thank you, Matthew, for that comprehensive, clear understanding and background to the, the mechanisms behind Geranimo. And I'll just make a couple of comments. On each of those slides that Matthew's given, he's given the scientific papers where that work has been presented and, and, and properly tested and, and, and reviewed. So that all that Matthew said in there is proper, credible science. So when you've clicked on Teranimo and gone to the website and you've clicked on Teranimo UK, you come up with a screen like the one shown on this on this slide. Uh, and it, the first thing to do is obviously uh, you pick the UK. You can pick the, the language being in, uh, English. Um, and you see that you can put a number of different combinations just by clicking on the icons. Uh, so you can have uh, tractors of various types. Uh, you can have various implements with them. Uh, we get dual wheels are possible. One of the things with, with the support from AHDB we were keen to do, and, and Matthew has done for us, is to make sure that as well as having a traditional potato harvester, there's a self-propelled potato harvester uh, in, in the range of options. Uh, so we have uh, just clicking, uh, Slurry spreader, for a slurry spreader, you can read a trailer of some description because you can set, next slide, please. Uh, so for, for, for each slide, uh, you, can, you can choose uh, the tyres. And what Matthew says is a limited range. I think for, for 480 width tyres, there's at least 85 options to choose from. There's cleavers, there's prior stones, there's Beretta stats, there's Michelin, there's, there is a very big range. So, so you have a very good chance of finding the tyres you want. Uh, and you can set the pressures or leave them to default. And that gives you options to ask to ask some questions. Next slide, please. So having followed through, as Matthew said, we think about, we've set the, we've set the machine, we've set the loads on it, the axle loads and the tire pressures. It's then a case of thinking about the soil. And we can think about the soil texture, uh, sand, silt and clay, organic matter and bulk density, as Matthew said. And you can enter that manually by putting in, in the layers uh, or uh, you can you can use other things. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, currently for Scotland and soon to be for England and Wales, you can use a map to uh, select a location. And I've just shown on this example, the strategic farm for Scotland in Fife. Uh, and if you click on the map, you can then get the soil data that's in the database that's housed. Uh, now, obviously, if you do use that system, you really do need to check because the soil surveys good as they are across the UK, aren't always perfect. But we, we have the data in for Scotland and with the help from um, Alice at AHDB, uh, we now have access to the data that's housed at Cranfield uh, University for the England and Wales data. And Matthew's got that under test at the moment and that should be available in a couple of weeks uh, to download. Oh, but you can always put your own soil data in there fairly easily. Next slide, please. Uh, so having set the the sort of soil, you then want to think whether the soil's uh, dry, moist or wet, using the examples that Matthew's talked about, or you can put in data uh, as, uh, for suction or ten, uh, water potential as you would get from a, uh, from a tensiometer, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, have, if you then click across the screen, uh, you then get the results and it gives you the contact stresses under each of the sets of wheels. Uh, and uh, you can you can check the machine. There's a, on the bottom of the screen. You can see the machine you've got set up. You've got the tire pressures. Did I enter everything right? And you have the question there: uh, Is this a repeated wheeling? I know repeated wheeling has been one of the things as we've talked to industry that people have been interested in and asked questions about. So you, you can have that: Is is the cumulative effect of multiple tires going on to the system there? Next slide, please. So the the the, the final output, if you like, is the profile strength and stress. So you get for each of the tyres or each of the loads a, a, a graph which has got depth on the uh, y-axis and the blue line gives you the uh, stress that's created. And if the stress exceeds the strength of the soil, uh, then if it's in the red zone, you're exceeding that strength of the soil by a lot. If you're in the yellow line, uh, yellow zone or the amber zone, uh, you're, you're in, a, in a bit of uh, you're probably on the border, and if you're in the green zone, you're okay. Now, there's a couple of quick comments about that. The first is you know, maybe in the maybe if you're exceeding the, the strength, if you're in the red zone in the surface, 
you might be less concerned than if it gets because in the, in the surface, perhaps you can do something about that by ploughing. But if you've got compaction at depth, there are very little, very few options for anything you can do. So uh, the, the, it gives you a, a very clear indication of when I'm likely or when you're likely to, to, uh, to exceed the strength of the soil and thus create a compaction effect. And you can check the, the, check the thing for repeated viewings. Next slide, please. So um, I suppose the conclusions from this are the Teranomo model with Matthew and his team have, it's out there, it's free to use. So try it, give it a try. It's updated quite often. It has relevant equipment in there. It includes things like tracks and all the different tyres. You've got soil, UK soils data in there. You can think about repeated wheelings. And this allows you to make uh, or ask some serious questions. You can say, Is, am I damaging my soil? Do I, if, I'm, if I'm making a choice of tyres, do I need to, do, does one tyre give me a better answer? Do I need to cha change the inflation pressures? If I move from road to field, uh, do I need to, would I be better not to have fill it, fully load my, my, my trailers up or would I be better, do I see a real benefit if I don't put full, act, if, I, if I cut the loads on my, my, my trailers? Um, so how much worse is, is, will, will the risk of compaction be if I work in wet conditions? Can I suggest limits on some machines? Are some machines always going to cause problems for me and compact my soil? So can I think about this? So what Teranomo is doing is allowing the, the user to ask questions, to think about their enterprise and, and answer some questions. So I think it's my our final slide now, please. Next slide. Yep, thank you. Uh, so just to say thank you, this has been this work's been largely funded by AHDB, or Matthew, as he says, has been ongoing for many years. Um, there's a number of partners involved in the uh, in the Grow Platform project, uh, and they're all listed with, the, with their symbols. And we must thank, obviously, our current and past colleagues for their help. So that's, I think, us done for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blair and Matthew. That was really insightful. And who would have thought that, that so much um, sort of research had to go into producing such an amazing tool? I do actually have one question here. This is for Blair that's come in. And it says, this is from James Trounce. And it says, so, do you think poor soil conditions after wet winters are linked to the loss of OM from the soil? Is it adding OM rather than cultivations? that causing the, uh, the cause of producing the solution? Uh, I think that the, the wet winters and wet, not cold winters, so we're not getting freezing, we're not getting cracking. If we get freezing, we get cracking. I think the, the as the soil gets wet, it gets, gets anaerobic and the anaerobic organisms take over. So we lose the good biology and thus when spring comes, they, they're not there to create the biopause and that sort of thing. So I think it's, there's a combination. There's certainly interaction between the amounts of organic matter and how wet they get, and how quickly uh, that oxygen that's in the soil is used up. Uh, so there's a combination between cultivation and or, and organic matter. But I think the the wet the wet conditions under whether whether you've whether you've cultivated or not, being saturated soil is is not just not good. Apart from a, the odd example where there's rice or something like that, but there's not much rice growing at the moment here. That's lovely. Thank you very much for that. We have some more questions coming in, so keep them all coming in and we'll have a big question session at the end. Um, so thank you very much to both of you. And don't forget, if you actually put your basis questions, your, your basis and then Roso points um, into, the, into the chat, we'll actually uh, put those in for you. Um, and now to introduce Harry Henderson. Hello. So, right. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak to you, uh, Antonio. Thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, I thought I'd just take you through a couple of slides uh, as a as um, as a practical introduction intro application of uh, Teranimo. If we can go to the next slide, please, uh, Christian. We've got a poll coming up. So, rather than a question, it's more of a poll. It's it's a kind of a, what what do you think? So, what operation comes or brings the greatest risk of soil compaction? Is it seedbed prep, planting, crop care with your sprayer, your fertilizer spreader, the harvester, um, as Matthew's mentioned, either on tracks or trailed or self-propelled, or the trailers at harvest. So um, just take a few seconds. I don't have the answer. There is no right answer. It's just an, uh, an expression of your opinion of what you think carries the greatest risk of compaction. So I'll give you a few more seconds, Christian. Yeah. 
we've got about 60% people now, so I'll give it another five seconds or so, then I'll show the results. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. And it's and I suppose it's not a surprise to anybody. Um Zebra prep, um, of course that's coming in earlier as you can get in the season. Um in the last um presentation we did with uh four farmers or three farmers and Philip Wright, Philip uh, showed us some uh slides of some uh, not so much com uh, compaction but certainly capping of uh, the seedbed at depth and creating a PAM if you have repeated cultivations at depth and that's possibly coming from uh, seed bread pet. Planting, planting nothing, crop care not a thing, 1% or say harvester 3% and that's 64% who've got trailers at harvest and I think one of the concerns of a lot of this work that, uh, uh, that, that uh, potato growers get it undertake is you want to be viewed favourably if you're renting land for potato production you want to be viewed favorably when you come back in five six seven eight years time thinking okay yeah these guys left my field in good condition um then then the trailers the compaction the whole the gambit really is quite a an important consideration when you're trying to get to um back onto uh land that you've rented a few years ago um interesting antonio and i had a an email from a frustrated trailer manufacturer who said why don't farmers buy trailers, smaller trailers, or, or uh, trailers with powered axles? You can reduce the um, tractor size. You can keep compaction at bay because the tra trailer axle is powered. This is only twenty thousand quid per trailer. That's easy. That's a lot easy. That's a lot cheaper than hiring a uh, a big tractor to get an unwheel driven trailer off the field. Well, that's maybe an argument and a debate that we can have for another time. But um, it certainly got us thinking. But our bulkers more um, uh, more likely that you can transport the potatoes from the harvester to a a, a road going trailer with a low pre ground pressure bulker. So there's lots of discussions to be had around that. I think um, that will we'll come back to this discussion uh, at at some point in the future. If we can go back on that's it. I go down to that slide then, Christian. So going back to Teranimo, um, I was asked really to to input a machine that would be typical typically found on a potato uh, farm and i thought for for uh, for ease of use and and illustration i thought i'd go for a self-propelled sprayer i've gone for a 4000 liter self-propelled sprayer Euro european built sprayer and we've got the option here of 24 meter boom or 36 meter boom and these are the weights that you can see so total empty weight just over 10 tons for the 24 meter, just over 11 for the 36. And then with a, a fully laden sprayer, clean water tank as well, 4,000 liters of water, uh, at least 400 liters of clean water in the clean water tank. You can see where that's, uh, how that changes the uh, uh, weight accordingly. And then we can talk about the boom unfolded, um, tank full, tank empty, and so on, um, as, as we go, go through the different sprayers. What I wanted to talk about was and take forwards was a 24 meter sprayer, 4,000 liter, and you can see highlighted at the two bottom columns on the 24 meter boom setup uh, front boom unloaded, tank full, rear axle boom unfolded, tank full. And you can see there's what 5.6 tons on the front axle and 9.2 tons on the rear axle with the boom unfolded. And I'm just assuming we'll go with boom unfolded because that's our, our working situation when we're going down the down the field. So taking that sprayer forwards, then we've got the three tire choices at the bottom. We've got the row crops, and you can see uh, uh, 38090 R50, so a tall row crop tire uh, on on this machine. Intermediate 52085 38R38. Um, you can see it's an intermediate, and as a flotation. I'm still looking at thinking of, of, of potato operations of 620, 70, 38. Um, and naturally, of course, you can go wider than that. You can go to a 710, which would have a, a very uh, a more flotation effect. But of course, you might not be able to get it down your uh, your potato road. We've taken the front uh, uh, the weight per front wheel, 
and a rip, uh, rear wheel and give or take. I know that the tires would weigh differently, but let's give or take, that's that's what it is per wheel. And then gone to the tire manufacturers. We've said this fry will do uh, 40 kilometers per hour down the road. And then these are the, the pressures that the tire manufacturers recommend on the uh, uh, for each of these tires. So you can see um, quite a lot of weight on the rear axle on the flotations we've got 55 psi uh, needed in the on those flotation tires so some some hefty pressures there um it goes down slightly as you can see as, as we go to uh, to wider tires we can have the, the next slide please christian so on row crops and uh matthew showed you this illustration um or the, the way that the the um uh, soil damage is illustrated in Turanimo and so we've got the row crops and the the two points you can see on this on this graph here are the, the front axle on the left hand side and then the taller points you can see are the rear axle so there's a substantial increase in soil compaction soil damage um, in the uh, with the row crops on I might just add I've gone for a medium clay loam in a moist conditions and when you have a go with uh, Tronimo yourself you'll get taken to these pages like, and then like Blair said you can enter the soil series yourself you can hopefully you can now use it in Scotland in your location or and hopefully in, in the next few weeks you'll be able to, uh, to use it in an English location as well but medium soil uh, moisture in this graph and a medium clay loam but you can see the difference in that uh, in uh, compaction that is, has resulted from these um, uh, 380, 90, R50 tyres. Just go on to the next clip, Christian, and we should get, there we go. And this is where uh, Blair already showed you. This is the line at, at depth. So the blue line, um, you can see dips into the red on the front axle and very severely into the red on the rear axle. And then as the, as your depth increases the blue line um, uh, goes into the green so less damage is, is um, apparent but you can see there that instantly that you're going to get ruts in the first what 20 centimeters um, the soil is unable to support the weight of the sprayer on these tires so we go on to the next slide please uh, question. again on the intermediates now 520 85 38s uh tire pressures on the front is 1.2 bar 17 psi and you can see that's much much better much lower and on the rear a lot more weight uh, a lot more need for uh, pressure in the tires so 1.8 bar or 26 psi and it's better um is it good enough and um, this is remember there's a fully laden sprayer and as matthew said you can decide whether and blair said whether you can decide whether you go in with a full, fully laden sprayer or maybe on, on these soil conditions you want to uh, go in with half a tank full. Um, again, so same soil type, medium clay loam with a moist um, uh, soil, set, soil moisture setting. And just one more click then, Christian. And you can see things are better. Um, the, the front axle is just dipping into the situation where the soil is unable to support the weight. But again, the rear axle is causing a problem and to a depth of what 20 centimeters we're going to see ruts until uh, until the, um, we get into more sort of more what 30 40 centimeters so ruts again uh, in a soil in a moist soil um, moisture situation so again you can make the decision is the sprayer too big i might add that this is really useful this sort of a data is really useful if you're thinking of changing your sprayer or putting it on different tires or getting a different or bigger sprayer let's say you can quickly work out okay this is the weight on the rear axle when it's unfolded the manufacturer should be able to furnish you this um, sort of data um, and so you can work out for yourself what type of sprayer you can or the size of spray you can get and how how, uh, how much you can fill it there's lots of fashion for a, a, a five six and eight thousand liter sprayer but you can see that in 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 situations like such as this you couldn't run so hang on is there another way of getting capacity and is it a bowser at the end of the field and you use a three four thousand liter sprayer that's a lighter build and 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 can 
continue with your, 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 uh, your capacity. So that's the intermediates. Um, next slide, please, Christian. And the flotations. So 6, 20, 70, and uh, 38. Um, it's, it's fair to say that wouldn't be overly considered a flotation, but it's wide enough to reduce the impact again on the soils. You can see the four uh, 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 illustrations on, the, on that graph where it's, um, it's a lot less um, soil damage again. And on the right hand side of your screen, the two blue lines for the front and rear axle don't go into the red. Uh, there are in the yellow, but by and large, the machine should be able to be supported by uh, the soil in a moist situation, in a moist, uh, moist soil moisture um, situation with a, with a medium clay loam. So, uh, okay, um, but 620s, are they too wide? Quite possibly. Um, do you need to lighten the sprayer? Do you need to not go in with quite such a full load? Um, all of these questions you can you can now start to think about um, from uh, from using Terranima. So, as as Blair said, it's it's a it's a it's a, um, a clever system. Um, if you want to plan your next piece of farm machinery and whether how how much weight you can go on, even a combine harvester tracked machine, you can see quite quickly whether your soil type is going to be able to uh, support. Um, the machine that you're planning to buy um, with the different soil moisture um, amounts and the um, clay contents and so on. So, from a practical point of view, that's a that's a um, fairly good piece of information. Just go on to the next slide, then, please, uh, um, Christian. So, take home messages from me. Really, um, you can plan the size and weight of your equipment and match the tyres uh, and to your soil type. Um, I haven't mentioned VF tyres, and I should. Um, the manufacturers are claiming well a 40% increase in load uh, capacity, or if you choose a 40% reduction in um, uh, uh, soil uh, um, compaction for the same actual weight. Um, so there's some really interesting tyre technology coming onto the market now, and you'll have noticed things like IF coming on and VF, very flexible. Um, uh, these relate to the tie walls, and you can see tires being run at very, very low pressures. In fact, the case tractor, the wheeled case tractor, has got VF tires, and you can see how almost flat looking the, the rear tires are. And these are VF tires set at the right, uh, right pressure. It brings you on then to think about well, if just looking at that case tractor for a minute, uh, you want to go bombing off down the road, go home at 50, 60 kilometers an hour. Are you going to be able to do that and um, safely? Probably the time manufacturers would, would wince and say, no, not really. So then is that the um, time to consider auto inflation systems? Some manufacturers, tractor manufacturers, have this um, as an option inbuilt, but if you you can also retrofit a tire auto auto inflation system, um, it's easier if you have a an air system on the tractor. If it's a 50k tractor, it will have that as standard, but it can be fitted to a to a non 50k tractor as well. The, the, the compressor can be added, and you just flick a switch in the in the uh, in the in the cab, and the tires will either deflate or inflate depending on what what you're doing going down the road or or what. It would be very handy on a sprayer. I'm sure that you can just knock down the the um, the pressures as soon as you open the booms and then flick it back up to road mode when your booms are unfolded. There's some comment that some of these systems don't function quickly enough to go down the road, um, but um, it's certainly a start and it's, I think there's a, an economic case for if you're doing lots of road work. As with, um, I think everyone would say, specify the tire, tallest tire possible, then look at width. Um, I've got the photograph of that John Deere on the left there that didn't come with the tallest tires and it's, it hasn't got enough footprint on the ground and it should have got come with with taller tires on really but uh, that's uh, the, the choice of the, of the purchase really and then there's there's lots of opportunities for staff training and for a tire specialist to come on farm all of the major tire specialists would have regional guys that will come out with a way cell that will weigh your tractor uh, and look at what you do 
and suggest the best tyres for your operation, whether it's a, a grassland operation or potatoes or cereals or a mixture. They 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 really do have some some good tyre specialists that will be happy to come out and visit you, um, even either before you've bought tyres or or do staff training after you've after you've bought them. And then the machine in the middle, we can calculate that uh, through Teranimo um, for its uh, for its compaction. These machines tend to be for traction rather than flotation. So whilst tracks look like they've got flotation, um, it's a it's a heavy rig and it's not really built for flotation it is built for traction so it's worth checking these sorts of things out in Toronto and as Matthew showed with a graph you can get peak pressures underneath those uh, those idle rods so it's it's a good system um, as Blair said have a go put your machine into it see what you come up with and uh, and and plan your operations accordingly and I think that's it from me Matthew oh, um, Christian That's lovely. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, and it's nice to see uh, that you actually managed to demonstrate, you know, so sort of the practical uses of, of this, this great tool. Um, so now I'm actually just going to go and hand straight over to Liz Stockdale, who uh, will, will take us through um, her presentation. Over to you, Liz. Thank you. Hi, and good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just update you on some work that's been going on in the AHDB Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. Um, particularly looking at the work there to use a soil health scorecard approach and, and how we might incorporate that into monitoring. I'm just really going to give you a very quick flavour. There have been other monitor farm presentations recently and some of you might have had to sit through me withering on in those too. Next slide please Christian. So just to benchmark ourselves and recognise where we are, absolutely Soils are unique. It's really important to look at that soil map if we're doing something like benchmarking for Teranimo. And that's to understand the inherent soil characteristics, the ones we can't change. And those are things that drive risks like um, compaction risks or erosion risks. Things like soil depth, these aren't good potato soils that I'm showing you on the picture here, unless you have dynamite available to, to deepen the soil, which isn't going to really be available to anyone. And texture too is just something that we need to know about that balance of sand, silt and clay content ideally across the whole range of the profile. So that soil type sets those inherent limits, particularly but not only to physical properties. And the use of that background soil type understanding really leads us to an understanding, a better understanding of trafficability, workability and risks of compaction, as we've seen demonstrated so well. But I want to just talk a little bit more about how we can get a better and fuller understanding of how management might modify soil properties and enable us to take more informed action. And that's really where this sort of new phrase that seems to have sprung up in the soil science world over the last few years, soil health fits in. So we need to know about our soil type, its character, the things we can't change about it. And then we need to put that soil into the best health possible to um, maximize our ability to, to utilize cropping to utilize photosynthesis to really make the best of the potential that we have available. Next slide please. So we've been looking at in the Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership the way to develop the right sort of tools to do that sort of monitoring and this isn't about making regular repeated measurements. In the top left hand corner of this slide you can see that many of you will already be taking regular measurements of pH or routine nutrients by fields or even by zones and grids to guide fertilizer management planning and we need to do that really quite regularly through the rotation and make decisions that are on a crop by crop basis. But actually wider soil management and soil health decisions are often made for the whole rotation and that, that can be tricky. Um, and so we need to have some tools that also allow us to, to be able to take that sort of step back from this crop in this year and have a look at the properties of the soil as a whole. I think it's a bit like when I get that call from the GP when my birthday ends in a zero and I'm summoned for something that's called a routine soil health, sorry, a routine health check where my basic height and weight and a number of properties are measured about my health to give me some clues on how to manage my lifestyle better. I always get advice to eat less cake and perhaps drink less at weekends, but more, less about me and more about mud. So we need to be able for soil health to put these depth 
sort of properties together, the physics, the chemistry and the biology to really understand how they interact. So we need a slightly different approach than we might have previously used in the context of fertiliser management planning. The kit you use though is very simple. So we've made sure that it's possible to do fairly quickly. We're talking about here it taking about 15 to 20 minutes per site to make these assessments. It can take a little bit longer if the soil's sticky or tricky, but nonetheless it's, it's not a big job for each site. One spade, one for me, it's always a bucket to carry things around in. And I use a clipboard as well as my phone. And I use my phone because actually now being able to geolocate my site is really useful. Using something like what three words or other GPS locators um, allows me to reliably go back to the same place time after time. And that helps in terms of monitoring to make sure that the factors that drive spatial variability don't actually interfere with the sample I collect. In the past, what we've tended to do is say things like walk a W to bulk samples from across a whole field, but that's only useful if we want to know a value for a whole field. What we really monitoring want to be able to do is go back to the same point time and time again to be able to see how that particular place in the landscape is changing. It does mean we have to choose those places well to make our monitoring decisions. That's not something a scientist can tell you. You need to decide where in the farm system those points are best placed. But geolocate them and then go back and sample once every two, five years, depending on what your rotation looks like, at least every five years. And that fits really nicely with something like farming rules for water and the requirements to make that regular soil sampling. Sample within five metres that allows for uh, the drift of satellites that happens, but also is allows us to not dig, just end up with a very big hole in the field because we actually dig a hole each time in the same spot. We do a mix of infield scoring, for visual assessment of the soil structure, the VES system, um, and also to count earthworms, and at the same time also to collect samples to send away for more extended analyses. So we're bringing together this in-field work with soil samples sent for testing. I think actually it's best to done by the grower because the grower learns most about their soil when they're taking collecting this data. But it is possible to get these kind of assessments made for you by um, an advisor who will also then help to interpret the data. Next slide, please, Christian. So it's important not to just to choose the right measurements, but to choose measurements that it's possible and easy to benchmark. And part of the work that's been happening in the Soil Biology and Soil Health Project has been about robustly checking those benchmarks and making sure they're valid. So things like pH or P or K, we have some of those benchmarks from decades of, of work uh, to set up what used to be called RB209, the Nutrient Management Plan. And so we've also drawn from the literature work that's allowed us to also now begin to give clear benchmarks in relation to soil organic matter. This is to give an indication of whether the soils are in the typical range in that target or green, bottom end of the green zone on the slide here. If they're higher than might be expected for the soil type and climate zone, or if they're in those areas that might start to trigger some degree of need for further investigation. So an amber or red. And it's important to recognise that we have different target levels for cropping and grassland systems, and we have different target levels by rainfall region and by soil texture. And we've divided these benchmarks as, as we present them for the project by cross compliant soil types. So these aren't farmers' definitions of light, medium, heavy, because I've been on some light land farms whose heavy land is, is barely a sandy loam and vice versa. Um, in heavy farms. But here we've got those typical those definitions where heavy soils are those soils that are above 30% clay and so on. So cross by cross compliance soil types, we've got this guidance to express or compare the data. And um, next slide, please, Christian. I'm just going to show you very quickly an awful lot of scorecards. I'm not going to try and unpick this data for you. It's the kind of thing that if we had an hour or so, we might talk through, especially if the growers who owes these sites are were in the same room. It's the kind of thing that happens at monitor farm meetings where we look at data from across a number of fields and think about the management in terms of the soil health scores we're seeing. These are all late harvested crops from around the UK so you've got low, medium and high rainfall areas here, mostly on light soils as is 
what we would expect for the, the rotations with late harvested crops, including potatoes. Um, and everybody's eyes have gone to a column called earthworms there, where the score that goes into the red. You've also noticed though that actually there's a balance of red, amber and green across many of these properties. Dominantly, the properties associated with keeping the soil chemistry in the right zone are about right, certainly in terms of um, phosphorus and potassium. You see that the scorecard here is flicking to amber at high levels of phosphorus. Only one of these soils actually has a low level of phosphorus, 12.2, so about three numbers down. The others are going amber because we need to be aware of a higher risk of if the soil is lost from the field and enters a water course. So the scorecard takes both environmental risk and production risk into account. I think it's useful to note here, and there might be some very sensible reason in the context of, of potato production, a couple of soils where the pH is being is, is rotationally at 6.4, which in, in other circumstances we might think is a bit low, but in, for some potato systems that might, might be exactly where it needs to be. Earthworm numbers are low, as we might expect, in rotations with a high proportion of quite intensive tillage operations, but they don't have to be. I think you've all noticed that couple of green uh, sites in amongst the red there. And it, the first question that anyone would ask, and we're not going to explore it together, is, well, what's going on at those sites that means they've got earthworms that other people haven't? What is it about their tillage or what is it about what they're doing in terms of organic matter management? Or is it they just lucky? The other information here, biological indicators, you saw me benchmarking organic matter. In general, on these light soils, we see higher numbers of light, uh, of, of soils with low organic matter. We, we see that just because the benchmarks are actually lower for light soils. But actually, the higher degree of intensity tillage means we have some soils where organic matter is a risk or is starting to become low enough to be a concern in terms of things like structural stability. Biological activity normally follows um, organic matter. The interesting sites are where it doesn't. And this is a measure using CO2 respiration or nitrogen cycling, and we're using and toing, trying to. Calcium and sodium we use here as reference values as part of our conversations around soils. So it's possible fairly quickly now to use measures to get them benchmarked and to start to think about how those matter and what links there are to management. Let's have the next slide, please. About a couple of years ago, Christian, we have the next slide, thanks. A couple of years ago, we got all the advisors we could, all the academics we could, and all the consultants we could do, along with some environmental NGOs together into a room to explore what good practice might look like in terms of crop production. There's a guide which I haven't given you the link to in the um, handouts here because the guide is being produced using the data only for the combinable crops but I just want to show you some of the principles that were drawn out by that big group of people in relation to late harvested crops and one of the things they wanted to do was not just tell us what good practice looked like but also to really highlight what bad practice might be be in the context of late harvested crops and I think it's really interesting and it isn't a deliberate thing that how much these link back to the risk of compaction so assessing the risk of soil damage before operations making sure that operations are carried out not just by the calendar but actually what's going on in soil conditions so the reducing the risk of erosion by inc including cover in rotations as much as possible as well. So really thinking about the soil physical condition in these late harvested crops. But the other thing we did was draw out actually what really good practice would look like. Next slide, please, Christian. And I'm pretty sure this is my last slide, just highlighting the need to what, what going beyond the normal might look like in terms of good practice. So again, about active monitoring, about using the tools that are available to us to make decisions around workability according to our soil type, but also perhaps according to changes and increasing changes in uh, rainfall patterns. Mapping compaction, so not just about assessing the risk, but going to see what the impact has been in the field. Relatively simple now to use a penetrometer to get a clue as to where the issues are and then perhaps we need to get the spade out to explore them. I just want to flag though the importance 
for rented land of that conversation with a landlord both to protect your access to that land going forward but also to consider what might be possible in other parts of the rotation to put the land into the best possible health for growing potatoes thank you very much That's lovely. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, if we could, everybody just uh, come back into uh, into the main panel. We do actually have some questions, um, and also just a reminder to to all our listeners that uh, we've actually got some handouts available on the dash on the dashboard um, of this uh, webinar, so you can actually download those for your reference for later on. Um, so um, I do have a quick question here for Blair, and that would be. Um, does the model take into account the contact patch size effect on traction and tyre deformation? So that's actually probably Blair and Matthew, actually, to oh, be fair. I'll hand that one to Matthew. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably a more Matthew question than that, actually, to be fair, looking at it. <laughs> that's a very relevant question. Uh, actually, we are about uh, to uh, try to implement that in Terranimo. So far, it's not implemented but we have a phd student that just is uh, finishing her phd with a very interesting um, result about this how the tires are working uh, when they have some traction as compared to when they don't have any traction then you have a completely different uh, distribution of the size of the patch is different and the distribution of the stresses at the contact is also different but it's not implemented yet it's coming Lovely. Um, so I have another one here, actually. What difference do you see with front weights? Is there an option to input this data? So far in Terranimo, it's default. So if you put uh, an implement at the, at, the, at the back of a tractor, then we say that usually you put so much front weight to be able to pull this implement. But we, we cannot play around with that directly on Terranimo but okay. it's, it's taken into account in the calculations. Mm, mm. All right. Um, and I'm afraid it's, it's all very, very machinery based at the moment. Everyone's very keen on their technology here, which is a good thing because it's a technology and soil health webinar. Um, I have one here which says, what would you recommend for people who do a lot of road work to get to the fields? Stability on the road is just as important as safety. And, and so dropping dropping tire pressures for the field would that be would that is that an option and then putting them back up when they go out how easy is that to do well i would i would recommend to invest in a, in an automatic system for regulation of inflation pressure for your machinery that would be the the best for the soil and that would be the the best also for the tires because then you will have the proper inflation pressure on the road you will not have uh, i mean the, the tire would work as they shoot on the on the road and then they will also work as they should on the soil because you can you will be able to reduce that pressure but i know it's it's still costly so it's an investment but it's available and it's quick now you don't have to wait 15 minutes to get some some the right pressure in your tire again when you go back to the road. Okay, lovely. Um, and to Liz, um, in terms of the soil health card, um, is there a, is there a, a data a national database where if you actually want to go and collect all this information and put it in, it can, can it be readily available, or is it just for the grower's own personal use? So. At the moment, we, we're just in the that we've got a year to go in the in the, the partnership project. We've been focusing on developing and getting that um, scorecard and that traffic lighting approach in place for those basic indicators. Obviously, there are already commercial um, services available, both using that and other similar approaches. And I think one of the things that we will be doing, that's a fair warning to anyone on the call who's, it, who's engaged in that task, is that we're going to be trying to bring everybody together over this next year to just talk through how best to, in the same way as the nutrient management guide, there's an agreement on, on how those things work. We'll try and do the same here with the soil health. There isn't currently any single repository of that data. Um, it's a big job to do. So um, the first step is actually to, to have the robust way of collecting it. So just at the moment, um, 
I would, if you want to get involved in, in soil health scorecarding and benchmarking your soils, actually through the, the local AHDB monitor farms, most of them are taking that process into um, into their own hands and beginning to do it within their own groups, which of course then allows you to have that discussion about the link with management as well. So I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. You touched on on how um, it's so important, especially in potato growing, um, to look at the quality of, of uh, the soil health before and after, especially in relation to rented land. This seems to be a really hot topic at the moment. Is there any advice that you actually have for our, for our listeners today as to how to go about approaching a landowner and what key things to actually look for? Oh, the, the answer is as big as the number of landowners in the world, obviously. Um, I, th I think there are some landowners and some, some landlords who actually are just really interested. And, and that's not a, a bad thing. And it's not a bad thing for potato growers because it opens up that window for that sensible conversation. Many landlords see potatoes as a really important part of that bigger rotation. We're running out of break crops. So actually potatoes have a really important role not just to produce my chips and crisps but also in relation to a whole number of other rotational um, values so i think it's really important to just begin the conversation i think the simplest things are usually the best so actually things that can be regularly measured and, and safely measured are really sensible we know that the biggest risks are probably around compaction and potatoes and putting the soil into good health in the rest of the rotation means building in those practices that help to build effective soil structure and also to as um, one of the questioners early, Pat, earlier on pointed out building organic matter in other parts of the rotation helps to improve the soil resilience in the context of potatoes one of the nice things about Teranomo is that we can look at the impact of those changes on actually how the soil will behave so actually what will what will happen to my soils and what will happen to the risk of compaction if i do manage to build my organic matter by another one or so percent so i think there's some really nice opportunities here but i know the conversations will always be more tricky than i imagine because i'm a scientist I think, so talking to people is easy i don't know if harry has any practical advice for people yes yeah, it's, it's very difficult i think um I think the gist of all of these these soil care things is being looked upon favourably when you approach a farmer to rent some land and they think, okay, yeah, you did a good job. And I know um, it's been mentioned in the past that um, harvesters have been specified with tracks just to to try and help the situation when you harvest potatoes and you leave the field in good condition in order to be invited back or to be accepted back in six, seven years' time, whenever it comes round into that. To, into the rotation again um, so it's an important thing and whether cover crops can help whether spading helps i don't know um, i'm just throwing things out there but it's and and whether trailers with powered axles and to just get potatoes from the harvester to the roadside to leave the field in good condition all these things need to be need to be considered um, in terms of in the climate are we experiencing a quicker breakdown in autumn weather it used to be seemingly when we were all kids we, the autumn used to go on into october and the dry soils and that sort of thing perhaps that's maybe not so much a thing of the past but it's it's something that we have to consider and if you were to say to a farmer you can expect a sharp abrupt end to the summer and straight into winter like we have in 2019 and we had in uh, in this uh, in, in the 2020 back end where it just started raining in mid-September and didn't stop, then it has to be a consideration in, in preserving fields for so you for the, for the only reason that you can be invited back onto that farm um, when the time comes. Mm. Indeed. I've got a question here from David Hoyles. Hello, David. Um, in a field of potatoes, when is the best time of year or occasion to use a penometer? Penometer, please. Penetrometer. Try to say that right. Penetrometer. Um, the, 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 the quick answer to that is when the soil is at field capacity. Um, but if, you, if you're just doing comparisons, you, know, you want the soil water status to be the same. And probably the best, the best time is, and field capacity uh, is really after you've had a good lot of rain and then, then you know, perhaps two dry days. So the soil's got got really wet and then had a chance to drain properly uh, and when, when that's happened is is the ideal time 
um, to, to use a penetrometer. Lovely, thank you. And I have one more question here. This is from Richard Crowhurst. Does the model take into account the contact patch size effect on traction and tyre deformation? No, that's a bit the same question as before. The, so until now, it's only uh, uh, the contact patch of tyres without traction. So we right. don't take that into account. Okay, that's lovely. Um, I don't think I have any more questions from anybody here, actually. So basically, um, I will now go to um, close our session, if that's all right with you. So basically, um, a big thank you to all our presenters. And also thank you very much to you all for listening to the, today. Um, you will receive a survey immediately after this, so please do take the time to fill it in because we always want to hear your thoughts. And the recording will be available shortly. And if you have any questions at all, you can always contact me or Harry, and then we can pass on any of the information to you as required. We really hope you've enjoyed this webinar. There's more to come, um, and there's just enough time to tell you about our upcoming AHDB potato webinars planned for early 2021. Um, we also have a series of town halls style online meetings which have been advertised on our website at the moment and they will be on the 4th 11th 18th of February 2021 and you can access all this information and free online bookings um, on our events page on the website um, and also as part of our continuing potato soil health series and part of the great salt soils program we've also scheduled in some more webinars for the 17th of February where we'll be discussing preparing for planting and the potential impacts on soil health. <clears throat> and on the 7th of April, the topic will be irrigation versus soil erosion. So we also have some podcasts planned with topics including how to keep your landlord happy, rented land. And uh, we also get uh, a guest appearance from Spot Scotland also discussing cultivation techniques. Um, we hope you can come along to these and don't forget you can catch up via the events page on the AHDB website. So really it just remains me to say thank you very much for listening today. Stay safe from us all as AHDB potatoes and we very much look forward to seeing you all again in the future in person eventually. Actually, this is virtually. Thank you.